Thanks very much. I'm sorry I wasn't here yesterday. I was in another meeting uh, just down the road on wireless <laughs> medicine. And uh, I want to say I'm really uh, disappointing you, I know, for not having any slides. So I know that's really a letdown. Um, but I just was maybe to review and uh, uh, discuss a few of the programs we have going on at Scripps. Um, you may know that um, at Scripps, our CTSA is based on genomic medicine. That's really brings together the basic science uh, people at the research institute with the clinical folks at the health system, which is the largest uh, health system in, in uh, San Diego. So we have uh, one program that is really modeled after uh, the Medical College of Wisconsin. We call it ADIUM for Idiopathic Diseases of Man, particularly concentrating on adults. So really uh, the counterpart of what MCW pioneered. And we have now a few uh, individuals in the queue. It's actually um, been funded by various philanthropic sources. We have enough to support 20 individuals to go through that process. And uh, that involves sequencing of the individual with a life-threatening serious condition, uh, along with uh, parents or any other uh, um, sequencing data that would be scaffolding the diagnosis of a, of a causative mutation in the uh, affected um, individual who's selected. And we have a big committee review, and a lot of our program was developed in, uh, in concert with the folks uh, with Howard uh, and his team at MCW. So that's one. Um, I'll just maybe just go through the, a few and then answer your questions you have. We have a big program uh, called the Welderly, uh, which uh, now has over 1,200 individuals who are over age 80. Average age is 87, uh, ranging up to 106. Uh, these individuals now uh, accrued over four years, and we actually started it uh, when Kelly was with us uh, in the beginning in 2007. Um, and this uh, is a project that is um, trying to understand genomics of healthy aging, but has a, a really nice collaborative uh, opportunity because complete genomics has uh, uh, basically uh, uh, set up to do a thousand uh, whole genome sequences of the, of the 1,200 people we've accrued, uh, and that data will be all finished and uh, ready uh, in March. So uh, that was about five million dollars worth of free sequencing for us. We've done exome sequencing on about uh, three or four, 350 of those individuals, and we have some interesting findings, but obviously we're looking to much more uh, data from the whole genome sequencing of this large cohort. But the other flip side of genomics of healthy aging, these people have not had any chronic illnesses. There are no medications. They're cognitively intact. Um, but the uh, other thing is, of course, using it as a resource, there's predominantly European ancestry, over 90-some percent for uh, a uh, control group for sequencing of other late onset conditions. So that might be a, an interesting opportunity for collaboration. Um, a third area that we are pretty heavily engaged in is uh, in day-to-day -day practice of uh, genomic medicine is in uh, pharmacogenomics. And uh, we started uh, back in 09 a systematic program of, uh, of uh, cytochrome uh, genotyping uh, for Clopidogrel Plavix, which uh, after the extinction of Lipitor as a proprietary drug, it's now the number one prescription drug in the world. It uh, won't be for very long because uh, in the months ahead, it, it too will become a generic. But for the moment, uh, that's especially important because, uh, as I think you know, it's, uh, it's a drug that has a lot of variable response, and Allen and the group at Maryland has really led the charge in that work. But we have been uh, systematically genotyping all those individuals who get a new prescription for a clopidogrel who are getting a, a stent. We also do uh, as needed uh, platelet uh, response to uh, look at the uh, various alternative therapies. And then uh, I think along with uh, Dan and the group at Vanderbilt, they have a similar program. And I, I, I'm not sure if there are other programs like that. But we've also done now exome sequencing and have three other uh, um, significant uh, findings uh, at least to add to that, and we have a point of care genotyping uh, set up first now with a uh, uh, device that we're able to get the, uh, the CYP2C19 uh, uh, multiple alleles that are of interest in about 20 minutes, so before the patient ever gets into a cardiac cath lab. But we also have just uh, started a, a, a pilot with a company from the UK called DNA Electronics, which is a handheld genotyping uh, system. We'd be happy to collaborate uh, with anyone interested, but that can actually get uh, accurate genotyping in about uh, 10 to 12 minutes on up to eight uh, different uh, SNPs. 
So we're going to take that into other areas. We already have started a program with uh, interferon, uh, and that is uh, just genotyping IL-28B for people with hep C. So all individuals who have a new diagnosis of hep C, which is a very common, very large program at Scripps, uh, get uh, uh, front-ended uh, genotype to see whether they respond to uh, pegylated interferon or uh, go on to other experimental therapies. And then we're hopefully going to start uh, in the new year a uh, systematic program on metformin. We've done exome sequencing to understand the variable response to metformin. I think you're familiar with at least 20, 25 percent of people have little to no response to metformin, which is of interest since there's about 370 million diabetics on the planet, and a large proportion of them are taking metformin for no good reason. Um, and then the last thing I just would mention is obviously, like everyone here, we're interested in cancer sequencing. We have a program we call HUTS, which is human uh, tumor sequencing, and we have uh, multiple individuals in that uh, program. It's very much modeled after, like the one that was just published last week in Science Translational Medicine in the Michigan uh, program. I don't know if that was reviewed yesterday. Was anyone here from University of Michigan? It's a really uh, excellent program. I think uh, if you haven't seen the Science TM uh, paper, and then there's an accompanying editorial in Science last week, um, which is really nice to describe it. But basically, yeah. So the program is just, uh, as you might expect, paired sequencing of, uh, of uh, 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 tumor specimen and uh, germline DNA, um, exome sequencing of the uh, tumor specimen, uh, and uh, also RNA-seq. Uh, so those are the, basically the tools that are used. Um, they presented in the Science TM paper four individuals, uh, and also the response that they had to the drugs that were selected, at least in a couple of them, on the basis of that. Um, so we basically have a very similar program. We've had several individuals run through. Our biggest problem and challenge at Scripps was to get the pathologist to um, have tissue in uh, frozen for us rather than having it FFP. Uh, we've also, of course, had to work with uh, individuals who um, couldn't get another biopsy uh, and had to deal with that situation, but that's not really a, um, the, uh, the primary focus of this uh, project. So at any rate, uh, that's, uh, we have several individuals now who've had uh, sequencing, and it seems like that's a great opportunity for collaboration because all those, if all those individuals could be pooled, everyone that's being done on a clinical basis in the country, uh, that obviously would uh, help everyone, on not, that not just the patients involved, but obviously all the investigators. So that's pretty much what we're doing, at least of relevance to uh, some of the collaborative opportunities in genomic medicine. We also have a course every year, March uh, 1st and 2nd this coming year. Many of you have participated. It's the future of genomic medicine. Uh, it's our fifth annual course, and uh, it's a nice time to vet all the ideas of how like what you're doing in this uh, uh, forum to try to take uh, genomics into the real uh, care of patients. So questions? And he's, that's about it. Questions for Eric? Eric, could, could you maybe comment, um, a, a neat idea about pulling together all of the patients being done clinically. Is, is there like a, a, a one or two vendors that, that one could basically go to and say, tell us everybody who's doing this clinically so that, so that we'd have a, you know, some way of kind of capturing them and inviting them and that sort of thing? So you mean in terms of the, on the sequencing side? Yeah, I think unfortunately there's a lot of nodes of entry. Um, the, some are sending the um, uh, specimens to complete genomics, uh, to BGI, um, and others are sequencing them on their high seeks and solid. So, I think, unfortunately, there's a lot of different ways to get there. And then, um, I, you know, I think the, the problem is, of course, we haven't come up with a way to uh, easily pull all that data and deal with it. But I think it's worthwhile considering. And it wouldn't be that difficult, I wouldn't think, to yeah. be able to figure that out. Yeah, if there's just, if there's some, as you say, a point of entry or at least some way of, of getting the word out, there's probably a, a way of doing it. I would think Illumina would have, you know, would, would know at least who's bought their machines and right. if they're willing to share that. that yeah, and, and actually, I should have mentioned that some are also using the Illumina clinical sequencing service as well. And in fact, uh, for both, uh, well, actually for all three of those, mail order sequencing, uh, more than half are cancer uh, samples these days. So. It provides a great opportunity if that could be culled together. And I think the other thing, of course, is, you know, the, the uh, processing the data and adding in 
the response to drugs selected on the basis of that uh, analysis, I think that even just a year of follow-up would provide tremendous insight. If we had, the, you know, the, the uh, crowd sourcing, crowd sharing of all that data, it would be terrific. So I think one question that arises from the sharing of clinical samples, of course, is what, what the range of utility they may have um, only for other clinical projects or, and maybe this is a topic for discussion this afternoon, but how does that feed into opportunities for research? It, they're probably not appropriately consented for that, so. No, but I mean, I think, for example, the project I men, uh, mentioned of healthy aging, uh, as far as setting that up for controls, that's eminently um, poolable for uh, sharing that data. I think it might be a useful resource. Could it potentially could it have the sequencing uh, uh, task and you know for any uh, late onset uh, disease of interest in which there's a sequencing um, project ongoing. So most of the clinical samples are post-mortem that he's referring to because they've gone on treatment and there's an outcome, and the outcome is often time to progression. So I, I don't know how that factors in, but, but, but they usually, um, while they were collected in a clinical setting, the, the, the DNA represents post-mortem. I have a question. I mean, the point of care genotyping is obviously a tremendous issue. Yes. And uh, if one could, you know, collect experience with various platforms that are being pushed now by various vendors and, uh, you, you know, I think the key is going to be, you know, the accuracy and the, the validity of the assays right. uh, where, you know, a lot of point of care uh, platforms have, you know, deficiencies in that area compared to the standard platforms. I think that would be a tremendous uh, opportunity to go forward and, you know, put together a group that is actually engaged in this and perhaps deploy some of these. If it's a handheld platform, I could just see some of us run around our medical centers and using it and then share the data. Uh, that would be something. Can you expand a little bit on, on that? Yeah, actually, I have it. I could show it to you. I was just showing it yesterday. It's really a, a really impressive device. Uh, we're in the midst of of validation and some of that work's also been done at Imperial College in the UK. But it looks like it works quite well, very fast, and you know, it's just a, uh, like a cell phone device and basically it works with a saliva or a buckle a swab and uh, remarkable. So I think the point of care genotyping is really taking off and for certain indications, uh, whether it be, you know, the, the one of the, I think the ideal ones is the, the Plavix story. but. But the, but the interferon uh, in hep C is, I think, a, a turn, emerging as, as quite an important one, and perhaps others. Uh, so I think uh, that would be a great, uh, if, those, if there's an interested subset of centers that want to work together on this, it would, it would accelerate uh, not only the validation, but finding its optimal uh, clinical utility. That'd be great. The What's Greg, the, oh. I was going to ask, why can't we consent these patients? The, we're seeing more and more examples where clinical patients are consented for research, you know, through a de-identified process. Um, I, I don't see, I didn't uh, make that uh, statement, but I, I agree with you, actually. <laughs> yeah. I think for the point of care, a really interesting uh, case, uh, I think, would be in, in, in the Warfarin situation, because one of the things yeah. that uh, uh, we found in our work at Intermountain has been that uh, uh, you know, in doing our trials, we've been doing them in our tertiary center where we have an anticoagulation team. Uh, and uh, so we're really comparing how much does pharmacogenomics add to a really well-run, uh, high-performance anticoagulation team. But in a system like ours and a system like many's ar many around the table, there's a lot of uh, rural sites that don't have anticoagulation teams. It's individual docs trying to do it. My hypothesis is, is that, uh, um, you know, a handheld point of care information about this might have, in fact, much bigger impact on their patient population than ones that are being managed through a, a tertiary medical center. And that would be, I think, a very interesting collaborative project that could potentially be done if there were enough of the devices to, yeah. uh, to move. The question that I had, um, uh, you mentioned uh, coming up with controls for the healthy aged population, which is a, uh, struck me as being a very 
interesting idea about how you would define controls for a healthy aged population would be a dead aged population. Yes. Or, yeah. So, uh, so how, how are you uh, setting up your controls? <laughs> yeah, well, we debated about this for quite some time, what would be the best controls using those as the cases, and we came up with this elderly group that you're, I think, touching on, which are people who had died earlier in life, actually their average age is right around 70, of the usual you know, diseases that follow suit with you know, the population. So that's what we fuse to understand <coughs> genomics of healthy aging. But of course, um, you know, using these are as the controls for, I think ideally, um, health span rather than lifespan, which is influenced by all sorts of medical interventions, is a good uh, control group for late onset uh, genomic uh, projects. Getting back to your point about warfarin, I think it's a really important one because a lot of the genotyping for, for drug interactions isn't done because of the turnaround time. Warfarin is a prime example. It takes days to get the results back. By then, you're already at a steady state INR. And the same is the case for clopidogrel and others. So if you had uh, that data up front quickly, it would really influence, and inexpensively, because this is a very inexpensive um, test to do, I think it could really be a game changer for implementing pharmacogenomics in clinical practice. So I do think the point of care, although this is just a kind of way station until everybody has their pharmacogenomic profile on, on, their, on their smartphone, uh, but, you know, for the, in, the, in the meantime, this is a good uh, way to get that into uh, clinical care. David? I'm interested, uh, you know, we no longer can spin a hematocrit or do a urinalysis, so I'm wondering how you got the point of care genotyping approved. Is, does clinical chemistry give a stamp of approval to a small number of people, or how does it work? Well, first we have to show our IRB the data of the, you know, the conventional assay uh, versus the handheld, and then once we are, do that for a couple hundred individuals, then we have a green light to use the point of care for guidance. So we still continue to do paired sampling just to continue, because a couple hundred people is not enough for full validation, but that's the, the type of a program that we've been able to convince our IRB that it's okay to move ahead. So do you limit it to a, a certain number, number? Obviously, the people that do the test must be the investigators on the protocol. Right. Is that yes. It? Yep. Yes, absolutely. And does it go in the medical record? Yes. Uh, oh, sure. But I, th I think, uh, although there still are, there still is a lot of point of care testing done, uh, like, for example, platelet response in this setting is a point of care test as well. So there, not everything is a central lab, uh, and that's, a, that's often used as a corroborating uh, tool for uh, designing the best drug, well, alternative drug in this case, or drug dose. I mean, recently there's been studies to show tripling the dose of clopidogrel is the only way to override even the carrier state of the loss of function alleles. I was just curious about the thousand genomes that Complete Genomics is doing. Do you have plans to make those available somehow? Yes, we do. Uh, in fact, that's why I mentioned it as a point for potential collaboration. When we did that uh, collaboration, collaboration agreement with Complete, it was the in, with the intent to make that data available as best as we could with the genomics research community. So that is the, that is the goal. Next is uh, David Craig from TGen. Uh, 